started with our first session today, which is what is the data telling us? And I am one of your speakers. Um, I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I am the lead PI for the Humanizing Online STEM grant. I'll be joined, joined today by Di Zhu, who will be one of my co-presenters. Um, and... Michelle, would you like me to do the introduction now, or shall I wait? Oh, no, 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 you, 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 whatever you'd like. Would you like to say hello now? Of course. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see everyone via Zoom, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Di Xu. I'm an associate, associate professor at the School of Education at UC Irvine. It has been a wonderful experience working with Sean and with the team to collect data in the past few years, which we're going to, to share with you today. Thank you, Dee. So happy to have you here. My pause was because I was just scrolling the participant list to be sure you were here. So yeah, that's, that's what, what I figured. <laughs> Thanks, Dee. You know how to read my cues. We work together enough. Um, yeah. Okay, so we do have a Padlet, and I'm just going to put the link in the chat. I'm not going to screen share it right now, but um, for those of you who want to check it out, if it's not too much for you, if, you, if that's something that would keep you engaged, feel you, make you feel more included, um, the Padlet has some prompts on, in it that we'll be building throughout the day. So to, per, to uh, respond to any of the prompts, you'll just want to click on the plus icon on that Padlet, and you can um, add your contribution there. So our project team, in addition to Dee and myself, includes many other people, and I'd just like to acknowledge them. Uh, Mike Smedshammer, thank you, Mike, for your hard work on this grant, um, is one of our faculty development co-PIs from Modesto Junior College. And Kim Vincent Layton is our other um, faculty development co-PI from uh, Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, Dee is our research lead from UC Irvine, and Jeffrey White is um, a biology professor from Cal Poly Humboldt, who's played many roles on our grant, including one of our pilot faculty for the academy and has been involved with our research. Sarah Williams is a math faculty from Foothill College, and Brent Wedge is a computer science faculty from Modesto Junior College, who are also co um, our co-PIs and were a uh, pilots in the first version of our academy that we ran when we started our grant. And um, thank you so much. Such a, a, such a collaborative and hardworking group of people that we've had with uh, working on this grant. So our objectives for this session are to explain what humanized online teaching is in terms of the model as we're using it today and the problem it addresses introduce the Humanizing Online STEM Academy, which was our intervention in our grant project, and explore some very preliminary research findings about the, how the Academy is impacting faculty and students. So you're, you're probably familiar folks with the common metaphor of a leaky pipeline to represent the problem with STEM attrition. With that metaphor in mind, the water dripping out of the pipeline that you see here on your screen represents Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander students and women who choose to leave STEM at higher rates than white and Asian men. Recent research has shown that this problem is worse in STEM than in any other discipline cluster. While this pipeline metaphor may be a super handy one, it's simplistic and a dehumanized way of approaching this issue. And the more an issue is dehumanized, the more likely a person is to lean on unconscious biases and stereotypes to make up the rest of the story. And the, mainst the mainstream story that we typically hear is that we need to fix our students. There's something wrong with our students. Today, however, we're not going to be looking at our students through a deficit-based lens, and we aren't using the leaky, leaky pipeline metaphor either. We're using a different metaphor, which is embodied in this quote. When a flower doesn't bloom, you, flick, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. This quote embodies an asset-based perspective, which is the lens that we're using here today. When we change our questions, we see everything differently. The issue of attrition for women and students of color in STEM is actually not the problem. This is how I have started to see things differently. 
Framing it as the problem, I think, is perhaps our greatest miss of the past decade. Attrition in STEM is the outcome of the problem. And to find the problem, we need to look internally at our own work. When we turn to the research about why so many students, particularly women and students of color leave STEM, we identify many of the factors, we identify many factors that are within our control, including poor teaching and a competitive course climate. And when we unpack the data about what students perceive to be characteristics of effective STEM teaching, we find this at the very top of the list. The instructor is open, approachable, and shows concern about student learning. Being a professor means being influenced by cultural expectations. Culture is often described as being like the water in which a fish swims. The longer you swim in it, the more undetectable it becomes. This sculptural frieze, which by the way is from the Yale Law School building, it's right over the doorway, depicts a white male professor at his desk in front of his students. He's flailing his arms and yelling. The students, whom we can presume are all white men too, are downtrodden. They lay limp limpless with their heads on their desks. We must remember that higher education is the construct of white European culture. And it originated as a gatekeeping institution to educate the privileged elite white men and keep everyone else out. This representation of the professor and his students is symbolic of the power hierarchy and rugged individualism that is deeply embedded in the values of dominant culture in the United States. Masculinity and individualism go hand in hand. And in STEM courses, we see these values taking the shape of lots of different, in lots of different ways, but some of them are a competitive course climate, ambiguity, and an expectation for students to figure things out on their own. Curve grading, for example, creates uncertainty in students about what their grade actually is in a course and pits students against each other. There's zero research that shows this is a healthy environment for any human to learn in. In fact, the research about what students experience in undergraduate gateway STEM courses is downright damning. And while this very much is a social justice issue, folks, lack of diversity in STEM workforce is hurting everybody. There's no shortage of wicked problems facing humans today. And there is mounting evidence that diverse teams are more innovative and come up with more solutions to more problems. Diversity is an asset. That is a value we must embrace. And we all, also one that we need to convey to our students through the way that we teach. Fitting in is not the same as belonging. As educators, we must be more intentional about the environment we are creating for our students and work to become more aware of our unconscious biases and intentionally cultivate environments that ensure all students are valued for their true authentic selves. That's what belonging is. And we can't leave online classes out. It's too important. It has to start with recognizing that our students are more than names on a screen, which is really the way they come to us if we don't do something more intentional with, when we're teaching online. Without intentional efforts, online learning occurs in a veil of anonymity. And that's not where learning thrives. This is where suspicion, threat, and distrust flourishes. Online courses need to be desi designed and taught to include students, to get to know who they are as humans and recognize the diverse and brilliant experiences they bring to a class. And we also need to recognize that for many students, years of exposure to racism, sexism, ableism, and other forms of discrimination are included in those experiences. These psychological scars influence how students feel at the start of your course in a classroom and online. 
And those negative feelings referred to as cognitive underminers by Sia Bersheldon block your students' ability to achieve their full potential. When we look at the research of scholars of color like Gloria Ladson Billings, Laura Rendon, Luke Wood, and Frank Harris, who have been asked the, who have been asking the important question, how do we best support the academic success of culturally diverse students? Three common themes are trust, validation, and care. They are the antidotes to psychological threat, those cognitive underminers, and the foundation of equitable teaching. And before your mind goes there, let me clarify, it doesn't mean that we're making things easier for students. It means couching learning and connection and care by leveraging relationships with our students and challenging them to lean in. Because when a person knows someone cares and believes in them, they're going to lean in and push themselves. Think about your own life. I bet you can find examples there. Care and push can coexist. That goes against the grain of, I think, what we've been taught to, to know, but they can and they need to coexist. In the humanizing model we are sharing here today, instructor-student relationships are the connective tissue between students' engagement and learning. That's true face-to-face -face and online. That's a core tenet of humanized online teaching. So how do we do this? Well, we believe it's critical to start with effective professional development. Professional development is a change vehicle. And that means we need more research to identify the qualities of PD that change mindsets and build faculty confidence about online teaching. We also need to norm professional development as equity infrastructure, not just something else that another role, something else that those of you in faculty support roles have to take on. This is hard work. Developing, facilitating, those, that is hard, hard work and it's exhausting. And taking PD is hard, hard work too. And all of that should be compensated. And that's why institutional funding for professional development, making it a priority as equity infrastructure is an imperative. So as part of our grant project, our team developed a humanized online STEM academy and conducted a research study about its effectiveness. Today, we're here to share some findings about it. The Academy is a six week asynchronous online program designed to take about 10 hours per week. It's designed and facilitated in Canvas and taught by Warm Demander facilitators. Warm Demander is a culturally responsive pedagogy that folks learn about in the Academy. In the summer of 2021, 79 participants completed the Academy, including 68 STEM faculty part-time and full-time, and 11 faculty support specialists, including instructional designers, learning designers, et cetera. Participants came from eight institutions of California public higher education, including community colleges and four-year universities. They learned together in community, and they were provided with an $1,800 stipend upon completion. And that stipend very much influenced our extraordinarily high per, uh, completion rate of 98%. In the academy, participants think about an online course as an experience that unfolds over time. We highlight the week before the course starts and the first week of the course as high opportunity zones for developing trust and mitigating stereotype threat and uncertainty and belongingness uncertainty. During the six weeks, participants create a human, humanized, eight humanizing elements, including a liquid syllabus, a course card, humanized homepage, a getting to know you survey, a self-affirming icebreaker, a wisdom wall, a bumper video, and a micro lecture. And they also learn about the warm demander pedagogy, which is modeled by the academy facilitators. And those facilitators are key to the success of this professional development. This is not self-paced online PD. And we have a link to an infographic um, that I'll share in a moment that will let you dig deeper into this model if you'd like to do that now. Um, this is a very powerful quote by one of our participants, Safa Khan, um, that I'm actually not gonna read, but I'm gonna save it for you. And I'm also gonna share my slides in a second. 
um, because I'm a couple minutes over and I don't want to cut off the important information that Dee is going to share. But this quote here was one of the um, quotes that came from our feedback survey. And it was when we started to see that there was some significant stuff happening here. So I'm going to pass things over to Dee now, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the research. Thank you, Michelle, for uh, a wonderful introduction of the Academy and the motivation behind it. Uh, it has been a truly great experience in the last few years for me to work with Michelle and the whole team uh, in collecting and analyzing data to better understand the impacts of the Academy on uh, faculty perceptions, their instructional practices, and also student learning experiences. Um, I have to admit that by participating uh, in this study and collecting data, hearing what people have said, it actually changed how the way I interact with my students and also with my kids. It's truly amazing. Um, it's a collaborative project uh, that involves a number of dedicated researchers whom we listed here, uh, but our appreciation goes beyond that. Uh, the academy participants and students taught by them have all contributed invaluable insights regarding how the Academy influenced them, uh, which we're going to share with you briefly today. Uh, so we have two overarching research questions that guide our data collection and analysis. Uh, we would like to know what is the influence of participating in the Academy on faculty perceptions, um, beliefs toward online teaching and learning, as well as their online teaching practices. In the meantime, we would also like to hear directly from students regarding their online learning experiences in the humanized courses. Uh, those uh, would be the courses the academy participants revamped based on what they learned from the uh, academy. Next slide, please. Uh, so to answer these questions, we collected data from two samples a full sample of all faculty who participated in the academy were invited to participate in two waves of instructor surveys, one administered pre-academy and one post-academy, um, and both yielded a fairly high response rate. We also collected survey data from students um, taught by instructors um, who were invited to participate in a survey regarding their course experiences in humanized courses in week two of the course, and then at the end of the course, uh, which would enable us to see possible changes throughout the course in terms of student perceptions, their experiences, and their expectations. So in addition to this full sample, we also conducted three waves of instructor interviews from a deep dive sample of 10 instructors. So one pre-academy, one immediately post-academy before they had a chance to teach the course, the humanized course. And the last one is conducted post-academy after the instructors taught their humanized courses to yield uh, more newest insights that are not directly available from the survey data. So we love to see how the instructors are changing during the course, especially after they had a chance to teach the course in a different way. For this deep dive sample of instructors, we also conducted student focus group interviews uh, in the humanized online courses and uh, a total of 20 students participated in the interview. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide gives you a basic idea of who the Academy participants are. Um, so based on the descriptive statistics, it seems that the Academy participants who responded to the survey are uh, predominantly female and white. Um, all of the faculty participants have a master's or doctoral degree with an average of nine years of teaching experience and four years of online teaching experiences. Um, students who responded to both waves of surveys are fairly balanced in terms of gender and race, where half of the students are from a minoritized racial groups. Next slide. So with those data in mind, uh, here comes our preliminary findings. Uh, the first question we asked is whether the academy changed how instructors perceive or their beliefs uh, toward online teaching and learning. 
um, as the current research suggests that um, teacher beliefs and, and perceptions are strongly correlated with how they interact with the students and how they teach a course. Uh, so overall, instructors reported a significantly higher overall self-efficacy post-academy. And this is a construct uh, that was measured by eight different items, asking about instructors' beliefs in their capacity to achieve various teaching goals uh, in online courses. Among those items, in particular, instructors' confidence in their ability to meet the individual needs of students and to design a uh, welcoming environment in online teaching increased most pronouncedly uh, by almost 20%. Um, academy participants also tended to believe more in their own impacts on uh, improving student achievements overall, as well as on closing the equity gaps among subgroups of students. Uh, one important theme that emerged from our analysis of the longitudinal interviews uh, is that the academy helped the instructors to be more cognizant of the different backgrounds students came from and make intentional efforts to accommodate such diversity. Uh, so in the next slide, I give an example, uh, which is a reflection from one instructor. Uh, so this instructor mentioned, it's not just about caring for the student just in your course, it's about understanding where they are a little bit in life and being able to help support them so that they can make your class successfully and get what they need. Um, so this, these, uh, these efforts have also been recognized and reflected when we are talking to the students um, and also from the data collected from the students through the survey. Uh, based on the student survey and interview data, it seems that these efforts not only enabled students to be more open to coming to the course instructor for support, but also helped immediate um, the level of performance anxiety among students, which we commonly see in, especially in STEM courses. Next slide. Uh, we are also interested in examining whether uh, the academy changes instructor teaching practices. Uh, first of all, it seems that participants were very active in using the eight humanizing elements that Michelle just mentioned um, in humanizing their course, uh, the course that they, they revamped um, toward the ends of the academy. In particular, uh, many instructors mentioned that the use of personalized videos to introduce themselves helped establish a, a much stronger connection with the students. Um, we also asked the instructors if they didn't have a chance to use some of the, the elements, what is the reason not using them? And the most widely mentioned reason is that there is not sufficient time for, for instructors to incorporate them into their courses. So this suggests that um, ongoing institutional support is probably needed for the academy to have a sustaining impact. Next slide. Uh, so I think it's the, the yeah, here is, um, I think it's the, the previous slide, Michelle, can we go back? Do I need to go back or forward? I'm sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to, uh, yeah, this is the post-academy, post uh, the next slide, this, which this is one. after the humanized online STEM, uh, the, the academy faculty were, uh, hold on. It's okay. I don't know what I did. Oh, goodness gracious. I think it's probably the next one. This one. Uh, the next slide, please. This one. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. My apologies. Thank you. No worries. It's, it's not a Zoom meeting without some technical issues nowadays. Thank you, Michelle. 
So there were uh, many other changes uh, beyond using the eight humanizing elements. Overall, um, faculty reported being more actively engaged in promoting instructor-student social interactions, student-student interactions, and student content interactions. Um, instructors also made intentional efforts to make themselves more approachable and also to provide more flexibility uh, with course policies, such as um, accepting late submission and offering extra credit opportunities to students. Um, during interviews, instructors mentioned that these changes were partly driven by a shift in their perceptions of the relationship between instructors and students. Next slide, please. And here comes the, the slide, uh, which I feel really is, um, elaborates on what that shift means. So this participant mentioned, prior to this class, I always felt like an instructor was at this level, high level, and your students are down here at this level. And after the academy, I realized we are a team. And the less I view it as a hierarchy, the better my outcomes are. Uh, so far, we have been mainly focused on instructors' changes right, in their perceptions and instructional practices. Now let's turn to students' experiences and what they said regarding uh, their experiences in humanized courses. So overall, students reported high levels of satisfaction with a number of constructs, such as sense of belonging, instructor-student relationships, teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence, as well as positive attitudes toward online learning uh, in the humanized online courses. Next slide. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that a Black, Hispanic, uh, Native American, Pacific Island students who are traditionally considered um, disadvantaged in online STEM courses reported higher levels of sense of belonging, instructor-student relationships, teacher presence, and a cognitive presence in these courses. Next slide. Uh, so when we compare student experiences reported in week two and uh, with the, what they reported at the end of the course, minoritized students also experienced a greater increase in, in sense of belonging and student student interactions compared with white and Asian students, although there seems to be a little bit decrease in cognitive presence between those two time points. Next slide. A common theme that emerged from interviews uh, with the students was that they appreciate the approachability and responsiveness of the course instructor. Um, it seems that an approachable and responsive instructor not only enabled students to reach out to the instructor for help when needed, but also communicated a sense of caring that encouraged the students to feel more connected to the instructor and committed to the course. It echoes with what Michelle just shared with us that when the students felt someone care about their success, they try, they are more motivated and they try harder in the course. Uh, the survey and interviews with students also revealed a number of other things students really value due to the limited time. Um, I'm not going to share everything, uh, but here I would like to highlight a few themes that seems to be important. Uh, one thing is that students emphasized the benefits of having a clear sense of instructors' expectations for key performance tasks and appreciated consistency of learning materials. Uh, they also appreciated timely feedback from the instructor and also grading rubrics uh, that provide a clear guidance in terms of what constitutes a high quality response. Uh, students also noted the need to further strengthen student-student interactions. Uh, during the interviews with the students, uh, most students indicated that they had uh, limited, rather limited group projects with the class peers, and they would appreciate more opportunities to, collect, uh, to connect with each other academically. They did mention that um, among most of the courses, uh, students had already opportunities to interact with peers socially, such as through introductory posts about oneself and commenting on other people's self-introduction, but they generally welcome more opportunities that would enable deeper connections, uh, especially through academic content with their, their peers in a the class. 
Uh, so with that, I will hand it back to Michelle about the toolkit. First of all, we want to be sure everybody knows that as part of our grant project, thank you, Dee, by the way, um, we have shared the Academy in the Canvas Commons. Um, so if you use Canvas, you can log into your college's instance of Canvas, click on Commons over on the left. And if you search for the word, um, I think I've got it on here, search for hashtag humanizing STEM, you will find the Academy. You can import it into a blank shell in your own instance of Canvas and check it out. You can make changes to it and you can facilitate it locally. Uh, we have some goodies packed in an unpublished module at the top um, in, the, in the adoptable version that walks you through some of the background, some of the things to consider before you, you do facilitate it. And if you don't use Canvas, uh, there is the option to create a free for teachers Canvas account that will get you access to the commons and you can import it into your free for teachers account. Um, so I also have a link on the slide here for Canvas commons help uh, can be tricky for some folks for some institutions they have different lock controls on it. We also have a toolkit available on our website. Um, so if you'd like to check that out, it is something that you do have to request, but let me just walk you through um, a couple of things. If you request the toolkit, you're gonna get a PDF of the preliminary research brief, but since you're here today, um, we are just going to give you that preliminary research brief. So there's that PDF. Um, I don't want to feel, have anyone be pressured to fill out the form if you don't want to. Um, those requests are automatic, so the, the toolkit comes directly to you. But if you do request it, you'll get a printable version of our, of our infographic, as well as a direct link to our playlist of videos that are all incorporated into the, um, the academy that you can embed in your own professional development, use how you wish, or just use for your own professional learning. And we also have a collection of uh, part academy participant humanizing showcases that were created as a final project leaving the um, academy. So uh, just more opportunities to learn and resources to help you consider ways to adopt humanizing at your own college um, or university. Yes, Mike. It looks like we're getting a 404 error on the toolkit link itself, but okay. um, what you provided should work for people, right? Let me show you how to get there then. That's because I tried to make a, a shorter URL on our, um, I tried to be a webmaster and I'm not. If you go to humanize.ol and then just go down to toolkit, this should work. Yeah. So resources toolkit, that's the long way to get to it. That's Thank interesting. You. I don't know why it's giving you an error, but. All right, um, questions, Mike, can you help me kind of pull some questions out of the chat that may have come up? And if anyone does have a question that they'd like to ask, we'd like to invite you to raise a hand and we can use the microphone for that. Um, Michelle, so far the, the chat has been robust and fun and uh, I don't think there are any specific questions, uh, but if people would like to unmute and ask, is now a good time for that? Yeah, I, um, it's helpful if you can raise your hand just so we don't get folks stepping on each other um, with their microphones. So if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you and you're welcome to ask a question. I did see one question in the chat about um, additional plans for research. So that might be a good time for Dee and I to talk a little bit about that. Um, our grant, the grant that we're talking about here is coming to a close in June. We've applied for an additional grant, which we hope we're going to get, but of course we don't know the outcome. And if we do get that grant, then we do have plans to do additional studies um, and we will be, do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of moving beyond the qualitative and, and what we'd like to look at? Yeah, so for the qualitative data, um, you probably have already noticed that we mentioned that this is preliminary finding. So we are still working on um, working on coding all of the interview data and provide more detailed um, analysis regarding all of the data and we will generate several policy briefs and papers that summarize the what we identified from the instructor survey 
uh, from the instructor longitudinal interview, as well as from the student perspectives um, by a combination of uh, student survey and student interview. Um, and um, one of the things Michelle and the whole team and I, we have considered a lot is um, the possibility of collecting additional data if possible, right, to understand how the academy might influence student course performance. This is something that we have been planning and hopefully we'll be able to do it in the near future. Yeah, and um, having COVID be thrown into our, our plans over the past three years really put a, a wrench in our original uh, research plans in terms of looking at like a pre post study. Um, as we all know, there were kind of a lot of changes thrown into the instructional environment right in the smack of our three year project. So we had to had to regroup. And um, I recently just this last past weekend wrote a blog post about this reflecting back and really thinking about that moment when we had the conversation to you about how are we going to kind of regroup and 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 re strategize for the research for this project. And we made the move to the, the, the qualitative study. Um, and I remember feeling kind of disappointed that we weren't gonna be able to go straight to the student data. But I, I really think that doing this allowed us to ask different questions and, and, and illuminate different findings. And so I'm feeling very excited about that. And it's really helped me realize how important it is to really do that deep dive which the, with the rich, thick data and understand what's really happening before we go straight to look, you know, that desire to look at the changes in, in student um, in student records. Yeah, Michelle, can I just add one, one point? Uh, so one thing that actually emerged from our conversations with the instructor, which we are hoping to be able to, to directly explore is student persistence rate in the online courses. Um, several instructors that we talked to, they mentioned that they, they noticed a big increase in student uh, course persistence rate in the online courses, which would be a very important indicator of student engagement uh, in the online course. So one thing, if we have the opportunity moving forward to incorporate student outcomes, we would love to see how participating in the academy might influence student probability of persisting toward the end of the course, as well as, um, as the um, and the performance. Um, and in addition to the quantitative data, I totally agree with what Michelle just mentioned. At hearing what student experiences are, they might be partially reflected in the, in the performance data, but they may not be fully captured, right, just by student course grades. So having the opportunity to hear what student uh, experiences were in those courses were actually very very helpful and provide a lot of insights regarding how the academy influenced the students. Dee? Right. Um, yes. We, we did get a, a, an interesting question that maybe you could help us with, uh, or an observation maybe from Mar Dewey. And I don't know, Mar, if you'd like to unmute yourself, but you, you asked about the fact that this was a self-selected group of faculty that participated and the needle moved nonetheless. So people may have already been interested in this area and still uh, had that result. Could you, could you speak to the self-selected factor and what impact that may have had on the results? Yeah, I don't know if Mary, would you like to chime in or shall I just respond to, to Mike? All right, so I will just respond and Mary, you, you can feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. I think that's an excellent question. Um, that's why we included a slide to describe who our participants are, right? They seems to be relatively experienced. They had on average nine, experiences, uh, nine years of teaching experiences, four years of online experiences. So they already had some experiences interacting with the students in the online space and had uh, rich teaching experiences. Um, in terms of how the impact uh, would, that we observe from this group would be generalizable to others, that's an empirical question. And I will, I'm curious about like how teachers, for example, with less or fewer years of online experience, maybe they would benefit even more uh, if they had the opportunity to receive this type of training 
um, um, at, the, at the time, at the beginning, when they started teaching online courses. But uh, I think moving forward, if we have the opportunity to scale it up, it will pro probably provide an opportunity to, to examine the possible heterogeneous impacts by instructor teaching experiences and by different types of courses. That's really exciting to think about. Thanks. Yeah, Lee. absolutely. And um, we've got three minutes left for the session and we're gonna end it just on the right point because um, Renee Garcia has been, she just private messaged me through Zoom and she's got some, some perspectives to share. Renee was one of our participants in the Academy last summer. So Renee, I wanna turn it over to you. Hi. Um, I welcome. teach at Saddleback College and uh, biological anthropology, archaeology, things like that. And um, when I when I um, enrolled in the academy, it was in the midst of the quarantine, and we weren't going anywhere, not even to the grocery store. You probably remember that having Instacart, like oh my gosh, it's brand new, and they put it at your door, and you sprayed everything, right? So I found that being with my group her humanizing um, program was absolutely a lifesaver. It was so healing because in, in doing the academy, you're not only thinking about how is this going to reflect in your students, you're reflecting about yourself. So that humanizing aspect is how am I getting my personality into this online program? And that time of reflection, I mean, quarantine buckled down everything. And for some of us, we, we worried. And for others, we went internally, how this affects us. We went, you know, into our psyche and the humanizing just helped me do that in a very positive way. And I, I, I don't, I really don't think that this is just for students. <laughs> we do it for our students, but ultimately it so affects your own mental health. So I just want to put that in there because we haven't talked about that. And that part is so amazing. Thank you. Renee, thank you so much. And I do think we'll have more of that come out when we get to the panel part of our summit, which is why we do have um, 75 minutes carved out to hear from participants. So I'm so of those perspectives in at the end here. And um, yeah, it warms my heart to, to hear that it brought those positive aspects to you during a very difficult time. So thank you so much for sharing, Renee. Okay, so we are wrapping up this session. Um, we're gonna take a few minute break. We're gonna get started at 9.35, which is when um, Dr. Estrada's keynote presentation will begin. So take this time to go get some coffee, go for a walk, do whatever you need to do in the next five minutes, folks. See you very soon. <laughs>